wish I had some more room to spread out. You know, there's not enough room here. <laughs> well, it is 9 o'clock, and I don't want people to miss the mandala ceremony afterwards, so I will get started. I think it's 9.01. Welcome. How is everyone's spirit? Full. Full. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I offer you love. Um, this is going to be a discussion. I'll be doing most of the talking, but it, it may bring up some issues, some spiritual distress. Um, if so, feel free to stretch your legs, walk out, come back in as you need. And it may not. I've spoken to many people here, and I've found that so many people are so open to hearing this message that it is really um, inspiring to me. But I did want to start, well, first of all, let me tell you who I am. My name is Joshua Berg, and I am a chaplaincy student, did my CPE in Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I am a, working on my Master of Divinity degree from Meadville Lombard, which is the Unitarian Universalist Seminary in Chicago, working toward fellowship in the UU Church. Um, I am a student, so I have learned more from you, who are much more experienced than me. Um, hopefully, I can pass on some information as well, um, but I usually do this as a didactic for CPE students, so there are going to be some things that you already know, so please uh, bear with me. I would like, before I tell you why I should be doing this presentation, I'd like to do just a brief survey, and for people who are watching on live streaming, I'll let you know how many hands are raised. Um, so raise your hand if you represent an Abrahamic tradition. So I'm going to say just about everybody. Raise your hand if you are representative of a Christian tradition. Once again, most people. How about a Jewish tradition? One. Going once, going twice, it's one. Um, how about if you are Muslim? There's nobody here that's Muslim. I'm sure there are probably some people who practice Islam who are watching. Sikh, nobody. Hindu, Baha'i, Shinto, nobody. How about any atheists? You noticed I raised my hand. I am an atheist who identifies as a humanist, and I am a chaplain. If I am called to be a chaplain, it is by my teenage daughters to set an example. It is by humanity, because evolution requires we take care of each other. And that is my calling, and I am passionate about it. Um, we are not in this room representative of the populations of all hospitals by any means. But we as chaplains are tasked with caring for a Wicca patient. We are tasked with caring for people through the lens with which, through which they make meaning, not through ours. We may be motivated by our, our faith to this calling, but we treat people um, based on how they make meaning. So, um, sorry, getting with that forgot. <laughs> so although we are not representative here, that is our task, but I am encouraged because we have a largely Abrahamic Christian audience who is here listening to this. I'm so grateful that the SCA has allowed me to do this presentation and do it live streaming because this is so important. And the fact that you are here and interested in it is really encouraging. Um, so let me start, spiritual care for the nun. Um, I use that term, I originally used the term non-believer, but of course there are people of faith who don't believe certain things, and there are atheists who do believe in true love, things like that. So non-believer is not really appropriate. Nun was coined by a professor named Cosman, I believe, who does a survey on religious identity. Um, I have the name of it, but not right in front of me. Um, I'll get to it later, but nun is basically someone who is a non-theist non or non-believer or non-affiliated with religion. In this case, I'm using um, the subcategory of nuns who are strictly atheist, who are non 
theists who don't believe in divinely inspired texts in creationism and intelligent design or anything of that nature. There are some nuns that do that just are not affiliated with the church. So I wanted to be specific. Um, so, oh, two slideshows here. Let me press that. CPR and spiritual care reform. If, uh, I'm not sure the, the PowerPoint they downloaded, I, I rearranged it a little. This may be the one, but this is the slide I'm starting from. Much of what I've learned here is that the culture, the culture of spiritual care in the hospital has to be reformed in order to truly meet the mission of hospitals that say they are caring for every single patient. If you want, and most missions of hospitals and prisons and universities have some variation of that text in their mission. We care for every patient. If the patient, and, and I did my clinical, my clinical work in a hospital that was majority Catholic and the rest was Muslim and there were some other doctrines of belief. So here I'm an atheist in a hospital with Catholics and Muslims. Um, but <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. It really was. But if we want to treat, their, their mission was to treat every patient, even in that hospital, if there was one person, even one person, who we could distress spiritually because they were a non-theist, we're not treating every patient. So it doesn't necessarily matter the makeup of the hospital. We must treat every patient. And we need to change the culture and approach spirituality with neutrality. Um, and I'll get into that more because we don't know, we haven't diagnosed their spiritual problem. We don't know yet when we greet them, even if we look at the census, what they truly believe in their heart. And we don't want to be disconcerting. Um, so, it's a little about me. Okay, so, talking too much. Chaplaincy must be reformed to include the full scope of belief rather than just theistic belief. I'm running two sides slideshows simultaneously. Um, chaplains must work to educate college patients and the greater public. If I'm an atheist in a hospital, this is my experience. And uh, there was a, a presentation earlier of uh, uh, Patsy and Patricia, I believe, that said, you ask for, you say, do you want a chaplain? They're gonna say no because they think a chaplain is a Christian who's gonna come in and proselytize to them. We need literature. And SCA is working on this, and so are a bunch of other organizations that tell the patients and the nurses and the doctors what a chaplain does, what a spiritual care professional does, if you prefer that language, and many people do, um, what they do, and inform the patient. See a flyer in their room that lists their philosophy of life and under, underscores it and says, this is what the spiritual care team does. And they look at it and say, wait a minute. I didn't know that, maybe I need, because they're in distress, especially if they're angry at, at religion, they're in distress. They need to know that you can come in there and they can get some help. So that's why this whole uh, atmosphere needs to be uh, reformed somewhat. Nurses are, I went into uh, my, my CP and I told them I'm a humanist and I had to inform all of the chaplains what that meant. I had to inform the patients what it meant. I had to inform the nurses what it meant. When I first came in there, they said, well, we're a diverse hospital. Uh, my cohort, in my cohort of CP, there was two Muslims. There were Catholics. There was me. There were people of color. There were white people. There were Native American people, Indian people. It was very diverse. And they sat down and they said, the one thing we all have in common is God. And I said, um, no. <laughs> It's not the one thing we all have in common. It may be because God means different things to different people, but it's also not the one thing all patients have in common. We have to understand that. So that was the atmosphere of my CP, and I was talking to the professional chaplains there, not just my cohort. So we need to educate them. The nurses would say, the chaplain's here to pray with you. I can pray, but that's not necessarily why I was there. Um, so there's, there needs to be education and reform. And once we do that, I think some of the issues we're having with what is the purpose of a chaplain will be solved because they will understand what the purpose of a chaplain is better. And it has to be neutral and has to include everybody. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, a belief in gods is not a unifying factor. Theological, it's not just theos anymore. And it hasn't been for a while. 
I'm, many of you, I'm sure, have studied liberal theologians. Liberal theologians, um, I am in the Unitarian Universalist tradition now. We have many humanists, we have many atheists, we have many people who do not like the word God, who, you know, are very naturalistic. Um, liberal theology, it describes a form of thinking uh, that's about divine and human life. And it prioritizes, you know, the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral? In theology, is it's done with you uh, reference to tradition and to scripture in the traditional sense, and to experience and reason. That's the quadrilateral, and we fall more on the side of experience and reason. That is also theology, just as much as scripture and tradition. You don't need to go to the text, the divinely inspired books. You can, you can get wisdom from there, but you can also get wisdom from experience and reason, and that is also theology. Religion is not just praying to God to a higher power. Religion, actually there's an interesting, one of my professors, Dr. Mike Hogue, um, in his book American Eminence, which I highly recommend, said, by theology I refer to the pragmatic formation, critique, and reconstruction of the symbols, practices, ideals, and institutions that format life-orienting religious meanings, purposes, and desires. You can tell he's a professor, but <laughs> it, is, it is meaningful. I highly get uh, recommend getting a book. It's, it's talking about rituals and traditions. I just had a conversation with someone about rituals for atheists. That is religion. We're, we're, we're finding meaning. You know, we're, we're remembering a loved one who's dying. We're going around. That is a ritual, and I thank you for that conversation. Um, that is religion. That is theology. That is finding meaning. Um, I define religion. I wrote an article in APC about a secular chaplain learns to pray, and I define it as an, an ultimately positive experience. Sometimes it can be proximately negative, religious experience, but ultimately it's sublime, transformative or I imminent. It can be active or passive, and it's not necessarily effectuated, but it can be. It's basically religious experience is I'm experiencing awe in the Einsteinian sense. Everything is wonderful, natural, and I'm in the moment experiencing awe, and it's transforming my mind. It doesn't have anything necessarily to do with a higher power. Um, provide resources for all. I already mentioned that. We really need that. I'll show you later. The first time I came into my CPE um, um, office, I saw this religious literature, and that's great. By the way, I don't propose disparaging religion or excluding religion by any means. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying being neutral and all-inclusive. I'm saying have religious literature, but have other literature. So there was a bunch of religious, there's nothing on humanism, and by the way, if you want, I have, this is a shameless self-promotion for my own business, which is not so shameless because it's so small you can't see it, um, <laughs> but you, you're welcome to contact me if you want information, and I have uh, brochures from the Humanist Society about weddings and memorials, Humanist weddings and memorials, if you want those, there's only a few, but it's literature and I can get you more if they're not enough here. Anyway, so provide resources for all. So I saw this card and the, and the administrator said, leave this card in the room if you visit as a chaplain and you're not there. What did the card say? God bless you. And it said a chaplain has visited, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I can't leave that in a room because I don't know what their faith practices or their philosophy of life, and that could be spiritually distressing. And, and you think in the outside world, there's this controversy, oh, you can't say God bless you, you can't say I'll pray for you. Well, sure you can in the outside world. Speak from, you know, your, you know, what makes meaning for you and your own values. That's wonderful. Say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays. But in the theater of chaplaincy, in the arena of chaplaincy, that could be spiritually distressing even to one person. We can't do it until we have diagnosed them and their spirit and their emotions and know that that's appropriate, then by all means do it. But I had a wonderful chaplain I worked with, um, brilliant guy, and I won't name his name, but he would walk around, he would give candy to all the nurses, ingratiate himself to the nurses, I learned a lot from that. Um, I didn't give candy, I tried to give carrots, but they didn't want them, so just, anyway. Um, but he would walk around saying, in the emergency room, to random people, I'm praying for you, God bless you, I'm praying for you, God bless you. And it was heartfelt, it was sincere. But as an atheist, I thought, if I came in there and I have church hurt, or I'm Jewish, so synagogue sting, I guess is the equivalent, I don't know. If I'm an LGBTQ plus person and I really have turned away from God and, and I come in there and my partner is dying and I'm angry and someone says, I'll pray for you, God bless you, and I'm an atheist, 
I'm going to be much, much, much more spiritually distressed. I'm not only you're not doing your job, you're doing the opposite of your job. I'm just saying be careful. And I'll give you other options about neutral things to say. And by all means, if you know the person is religious, pray with them. Say God bless you. You know, but, but be careful. Can you explain the diversity of belief in your care? I had to explain what humanism was. I need to know. I go to different churches. I was at a Baptist church the other day. I was at a Quaker sitting. I have a Muslim friend. I talked to him. Get to know. If you're a doctor, you need to know about all the diseases. You don't need to be an expert in all of them, but you need to know, okay, this disease affects the kidney. Let me read about it. If you're a spiritual care provider, you need to know about philosophies of life and faith practices. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to be aware when someone says, you know, uh, you know, I'm a Wicca or whatever, you need to know. I'm talking about goddess now and God. Um, be, you know, be informed. Can you explain the belief in your care? Do you invite minority identification? Do you list atheists and humanists in your survey? Is that one of the choices? Um, are there other choices? You know, not just other, but literally all of them, or just a blank thing that says, what is your philosophy of life? I don't know, I don't have the answer, but you wanna be neutral. Um, hold on one second. Oh, try asking. Do you have a religious practice that you like? And many hospitals do this. Many hospitals do this. Or what can our spiritual care team for you? And, and that's still the patient may not know, but it's, it, it's a little bit more neutral. And even say, it's okay if you don't. Our spiritual care team is here for you to help you in a way that makes meaning for you. It's okay if you don't. Go into a room if you, if it's a, if some, you can even say, my spiritual tradition, we believe in God. Do you believe in God? If you don't, that's fine. I'm here to help you in a way that makes meaning for you. Let them know that. Do you have open-ended questions? What, that's redundant. What can the chaplains do for you? <laughs> Did you have a catalog card with various services showing your support for diversity? That's what I mentioned before. Should be something the patients have, the doctors have, everybody has. And um, this is a great one. Do you have diversity events? I don't want to appropriate others' traditions and pretend I'm an expert at Native American traditions. I'm not. I can understand and learn from them, but I'll bring in a Native American person and talk about spirituality from their perspective um, to the staff to the patients, let them know that you don't just have a Christian service. You don't just have a Jewish service, you have other services, you have other offerings and options available. You may not pull them off because there may be one person in the hospital, but you know, have them available. What is non-belief in this context? It's very simple. And I'm pressing it and it isn't working. Is it, is it not, can you change to the next? Okay, anyway, I'm gonna go back. There you go, no God. That's the strictest definition. Um, and, and, and like I said, God means different things to different people and some people who don't believe in creationism, intelligent science still believe in God in the Einsteinian sense, et cetera, et cetera. But in the strictest definition, you're gonna confront that. Um, this isn't work, there it is. Atheism and humanism. So, as I said, atheism is a lack of belief in gods. It is not a philosophy of life. I'm an atheist. This is how I live my life. It's just simply a rejection, an assertion that there are no gods. Um, it's not an answer to any question what a person believes. So, that's atheism. And that's why I, I'm an atheist, but I identify as a humanist. Humanism is more about what we do believe. It is a philosophy of life. It is a, and, and I encourage you to look up the Humanist Manifesto. AmericanHumanist.org, I believe it is. Humanist Manifesto 3 is the latest iteration. It's called Humanism and Its Aspirations. It's a page and a half, very easy to read. Humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without supernaturalism affirms our ability and our responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. It's a very positive thing. It's basically they use the term, we can be good without God. A lot of atheists get very antagonistic against religion because they're told they can't be a good person, a moral person, an ethical person without believing, without the instruction book. And they often say, well, where do you get your morals? Where do you get your ethics if not from the Bible? And I say, I get them from the same, the same place the people who wrote the Bible got them. 
And they, I mean, because that's my opinion, that it wasn't divinely written. The people use their intuition, they use their experience, they use their rationality, their emotion, their instinct, their evolutionary desire to help each other so that we grow, and they find morals and ethics. And we can be good without God. Humanism um, is knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. Humans are an integral part of nature, the result of unguided evolutionary change. Life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of human ideals and more and more. Uh, I encourage you to read it. And I encourage you to familiarize, familiarize yourself with no, other non-theistic beliefs. So I'm gonna talk about some other nuns. There's humanism. Um, and it's called HM3, the Humanist Manifesto 3, uh, is the latest iteration, but you can read it. Some other non-beliefs. So you'll see these align with beliefs, your beliefs as well. They're just not motivated by a belief in the divine necessarily as a divine, not necessarily meaning, you know, awesomeness, but meaning really the religious God, traditional Orthodox religion, but it's the same. So when you go into um, a room, a patient's room, you can align, you can, you can um, talk with them about what makes meaning um, from the standpoint of understanding. Human spirit is important. Human relationships are important. Your family, your loved ones, your friends. Respect for the individual and for humanity. Taking care of each other, serving each other. Cooperation, kindness, compassion. You know, and that's, that's the thing. We are moral, we are ethical. Christopher Hitchens, you may know, is a famous atheist who died of cancer, and I'll show you a video at the end, but he always said, when people were challenging his atheistic belief, he said, please name one way in which I am less moral than you are. And it, it was difficult, um, if not impossible. Um, let's see. I'm doing this simultaneously. Here we go. Find meaning in life, um, personal fulfillment, perspective and place in a natural world where very much nature, science, and reason oriented. Um, and I speak to we, I don't speak for everybody, but many, many atheist, religious naturalists, you've heard that term, are very nature-oriented, very in touch with the earth. So you can use that in your chaplaincy practice. Connection to and reverence for nature and environment. Deference to reason and science. Critical thought. It's okay to say I don't know. Religious people have also, often asked me, and I'm, I'm using the broad term religious people, and I hate to do that, I, I think we need to find another language to be more specific. But people of faith say, well, how do you think life came about? And, 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 and they want me to say I don't know, and they say, well, then why don't you think it was a creator? Why don't you think it was God? But I say, I don't know, and it's okay not to know. And I'm not gonna say I believe in something that I don't find justifiable because I don't know. So that's also something an atheist will feel. You can be good without God. This is the only life we know we have, and I'll talk about death later, but make meaning in this life. When you're in the room with a patient, talk about this life, don't bring in the afterlife. The past is prologue, as the bard said, and the future is not promised to us. Uh, ethical benchmarks are evolution, philosophy, humanist documents. I encourage you to become familiar with these things. Um, Choosing ethical action, reason, intuition, experience, and efficacy. This is the way we come to ethical action. I was talking before about if you can't find it in the Bible, where do you get it? And I was raised Jewish. My brother's actually an Orthodox Jew. Um, and he, one of my many brothers and sisters. And he and I have some interesting conversations. I like to redirect them towards our kids and weather. But <laughs> he loves me and I love him. But he says, if you don't have the Bible, the direction, that handbook, what, how do you understand what to do? Reason, intuition, experience, efficacy. You know, um, here's the thing, negative beliefs. So, um, oh, I wanna quote you something from Stephen Batchelor. When you talk about all, because people of faith always say, look at the world around you. This is God's creation. How else could this have happened? Stephen Batchelor, who is a secular Buddhist, I'm also a secular Buddhist, by the way. The view of reality disclosed through the natural sciences evokes for me feelings of awe incomparably greater 
than anything religious or mystical writings of any tradition can expire. It's awesome. We are so lucky to be here. Look at the amazement around. We are so lucky. I believe there are coincidences, but, and we were lucky. Um, it's interesting because Reverend Hall, who I very much respected, started this out by saying he visited a patient, and there are no coincidences. I went in the wrong room, and this patient needed my spiritual care. Isn't that proof of higher power? Now, to some it may be. I don't know. But I sat there thinking, um, you are a spiritual caregiver in a hospital where everyone has spiritual distress, and you walked into a room where someone was in spiritual distress. Doesn't seem like that much of a coincidence. Now, with all resp respect, I understand that that is how that patient may make meaning, and that's fine, and that's wonderful, and it's beautiful. But it's not how an atheist would. An atheist would say, when they say, well, God has a reason, God loves you, did he have a reason for the person next to me who's dying also to not be visited by a chaplain? Did he have a reason for me getting cancer? It's wonderful that you're here, but I'd rather not have gotten it in the first place. So those are the types of things that are very, very distressing to say, I'm sorry I got off on a tangent. Um, so, <laughs> and once again, my total appreciation and reverence for, for Reverend Hogg, very much respect. Negative beliefs are important to understand. Let's get into negative beliefs. Right or wrong, we have to understand the mindset of the patient as best possible and attempt to validate them without compromising our own beliefs. You can validate someone who believes something totally different from you without compromising your own beliefs. You don't have to say they're right, but you, you have to understand that's how they're feeling. We need to validate. It is all about perspective, and we need to know the patient's perspective in, in order to facilitate spiritual treatment. We need to know before we walk through the hospital and say, God bless you, and we don't know unless someone sneezes, and then you could say it. But <laughs> otherwise, reason, religion is, can be harmful. Now, I don't necessarily agree with these things. I am telling you what you will confront if you come into a room with a non-believer. Religious people are delusional and brainwashed. I'm an atheist, and I'm delusional and brainwashed, so I can relate, but <laughs> that's what many atheists will think, um, hopefully people will become more open-minded and accepting, but the, you're 15 minutes in a room with someone who's antagonistic toward you. If you come in and you're wearing an Orthodox Greek clergy robe, or you have payas, or you are wearing a, a, a Muslim robe, you're immediately going to feel anger. And you have to understand that, and not take it personally, and be empathetic, and be compassionate, and know when you can step in and when you can't step in. Um, the world would be better without religion. A lot of atheists believe that. Not in my lifetime, not in my kid's lifetime. We live with religious people, we live with atheists, pe with atheists, we live with all manner of people. If we want to have peaceful coexistence, we will live together and we will respect each other. But that's not necessarily what atheists, some atheists believe, and I don't speak for all, but I've certainly believed some of these things along my spiritual journey, and I'll be honest about that. Um, most of the conflict in the world is the result of religion. That can be justified to some extent. Um, it's a broad generalization, and it's much more nuanced than that, but you'll confront that. So I just want you to know, when you step into a room, be prepared for that. And I'm sure you are. I'm sure um, you have experienced that. Get out. I don't have anything to say to you. You're the chaplain. Leave me alone. Now, if they had some understanding, if the culture was changed, if they had a pamphlet, if they knew what spiritual care was, they may not say that. It's a long time coming, but hopefully it will come. I'm sorry? Go back? Oh, sure. And, and this, this is available to you as well to download. But no, I have no problem. Happy to go back. All right. Who are the nuns in the hospital? You may say, I've looked at the census. I don't see anyone who's listed as none, who's listed as atheist, maybe one. Certainly in my hospital, there was maybe one a, a year. Um, but the census doesn't tell the whole story. So here are some other nuns, and these, this is just a list of titles and organizations, just so you can familiar, familiarize yourself that there are uh, plenty of other labels and groups. So there are many atheists that may not admit to it, may not admit to being a nun. Um, agnostics, that's more of a softer term of people, I just don't know. 
Maybe. Let me take wisdom from here, there, everywhere. It's great. Um, American Ethical Union, American Humanist Association, Atheists United, Free Thinkers is not an organization. It's a term that's often used uh, for non-theists. Center for Inquiry. Foundation Beyond Belief. Many people of faith always tell me there's so many religious charities. You know, religious people are good. Look at all the religious charities in the world. UNICEF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, these are secular charities. Foundation Beyond Belief is a secular foundation who gives money to different charities. Um, they select different charities every month or whatever in rotation. And many of the charities they select are religious charities. They just have criteria that the charities aren't, the, the mission of the charity isn't to proselytize, isn't to preach, that it is to do the work. So they'll give money to a Catholic charity if that charity is doing the charitable work. So it's a good organization, but I'm just showing this to show you that there are many non-theists, many more than you think. Um, the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers, that's, that's another uh, obstacle um, altogether. It's, it's, um, the MAF, as it's called, is essentially a ministry for, for humanists, for atheists and foxholes, you know talk about that a little later because that's also an insulting myth. Um, and other non-theists, we prov they provide to chaplains the resources they need to best serve the constituency. More much of their service, unfortunately, is advocacy because military chaplains, as we all know, in the vast majority, not all, at the, but at, certainly at the highest levels, are, very, are, are quite hostile to the non-theistic perspective. I cannot be a humanist and be a military chaplain. I can be a UU and be a military chaplain. But anyway, um, it's unfortunate, but it's great that we're speaking out, and hopefully that will change. So I encourage you, as I you know, attend other services, naturalists, non-theists, I'm going to go through Secular Student Alliance, Sunday Assembly, Undeclared, Unitarian Universalist Humanists. Um, my school, Meadville Lombard, actually houses the humanist archives. Um, Buddhists and Taoists, people often include those in theistic religions. They're not. Um, the interim director of spiritual care at our hospital is a Buddhist chaplain. Um, they are not theists. And I'm going through here and looking at it, and I'm seeing that I'm not showing it to you. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, I encourage you to visit a Sunday assembly. Visit an American Ethical Union. These, pe these places have services. If you've never been to Sunday assembly, it's essentially an atheist church. It started in England, and now it's going around the States. They sing. They dance. They speak. They, they worship. They ritual. They, it's a all atheistic. Go, get a sense of what they do. Those are just some of the symbols. Um, and once again, okay. So who are they in the hospital? I gave you some names of groups, but none of these people are in my hospital. Who are they in the hospital? That everyone says Catholic on the sense that they're Christian or or Jewish. The hospital census doesn't tell the whole story by any means, and you know that, professional chaplains. I walked into a room, um, and it said Catholic, and the woman was dying, and she was non-responsive, and she was Catholic, and she was a practicing Catholic. Her children were my patients, though, who were in the room because she was non-responsive and actively dying, and I couldn't communicate with her. Her two boys were non-theistic, and her daughter was Wicca. So the census said Catholic, but now I'm treating people with a very different spiritual orientation. So really, don't make an assumption by what the census says. You can, you can take some hints, but you know, if, if a doctor goes into a room and it looks like the symptoms of the patient um, look, look like a cancer diagnosis, they're not going to go in and say, you have cancer until they actually do the diagnosis, until they actually do the tests and find out. So we need to do that too. Family, friends, and visitors, there are degrees of belief. So it may say, you know, um, I'm a Christian or I'm a Jew. Uh, I may be a humanistic Jew, maybe a reformed Jew. I may be a Unitarian Universalist, which is originally Christian faith, but now they're an atheist. So you don't know what the degree of belief is. They may, many people associate culturally as I do, and I'm very proud of my Jewish heritage, but I, I'm not, I don't believe. And so it would be disturbing for me for a rabbi to come in and, and you know, uh, say certain things. So I put down, I used to put down Jewish because that's how I was raised. I don't put that down anymore, but some people do. 
That's just how they identify culturally. It's just not their belief system. Um, God means different things to different people. There's a, there's a cultural uh, commentator, a wonderful writer named Maria Popova, excuse my sweating, um, who uh, I heard interviewed on, on NPR, and she said, in referring to religious terminology, um, some words have been vacated of all meaning because of misuse and overuse. So God, religion, prayer, faith, I don't know that they've been vacated of meaning, but it certainly needs some explanation when you say those words because coming from whatever the person being saying it is always very different, almost always, from the person hearing it. So those words are tricky, and hopefully at some point I'll create a taxonomy of, of phrases like the SCA is doing, but with religious terminology, who knows. Um, the good without God, what are some of the things and, and this is a little redundant as well, but I, I want you to be prepared when you go in. People say, well, what do I talk to them about if they don't have God? Life, this is the, I said this, one life moment we have. Relationships and intimacy, their loved ones, their friends, the people around them, loving kindness. If you talk about what they've given back to the world, how they've served, it is so comforting how they're teaching their loved ones. Someone said earlier, they're teaching them how to die if they're dying. They're teaching them how to suffer through pain and be strong. They're giving self-satisfaction and pride in what you've done. And you don't have to write a symphony. You don't have to write a novel if you're, if you're dying and say, oh, I've got nothing left in this world. Sure you do. If you have kids, if you have loved ones, if you have friends, you live on in the ideas, in your genes, in your thoughts. Someone, someone gave me a compliment earlier today, and I was so happy that I went and gave someone a bigger tip. And I'm sure that waitress was happy because of that and went home and gave her son a gift. And that son went to school because they were so happy, and they talked to an exchange student and introduced themselves to this person who was in a foreign country who didn't know anyone, and they were scared. And now they go home and said, oh, Americans are so friendly, and, and they smiled to someone else. So because I was given a good word, the ripple effect throughout the world is a little girl in China is smiling right now. I put that in the world. I didn't write a book. I smiled at somebody. Um, connection to the environment, um, that's very important too. Uh, in general, I don't speak for all, but many non-theists are very concerned about the earth. Um, so be careful when you come in there. Um, you know, if, if you obviously have a different political bent, Maybe stay away from talking about the earth. Um, <laughs> happiness. I'm going to give you some quotes. Now, I don't know if any of you know Sam Harris, but he is an atheist as well. A little bit controversial, as all atheists seem to be. Um, happiness is connecting with durable well-being even in the midst of negative. That's in the room. That's, that's in, in the room. Durable well-being in the midst of negative. That's what we're trying to do. Um, Happiness does not depend on what you have or who you are. It solely relies on what you think. I recommend this book by Matthew Ricard. He's a French Buddhist monk. He was a scientist, and he became a Buddhist monk, and he wrote a book called Happiness. He's often called the happiest person in the world <laughs> um, because they put sensors in his brain and tested him in meditation and, I don't know, if it's scientific, but whatever. Um, anyway, uh, solely relies on what you think, so it's in process. You're not going to make someone happy immediately, but you're going to make their well-being better. You're going to, you, you can't be compassionate, you can't be happy and sad necessarily in the exact same moment. So even if one moment you're a little bit happier and you smile, you're not going to be sad in that moment. Um, and it's a process. You're not going to end someone's pain right there, but you make, make them more comfortable. That, there's no path to happiness. Happiness is the path that's very Buddhist. Um, that is Matthew Ricard the French Buddhist monk. I recommend his book, Happiness. I'll, at the end, I have a slide with books. I also recommend his book, The Monk and the Philosopher. He talks to his father, who is a French philosopher, and they have a conversation. It's very interesting um, about religion and about everything else. All right, so coping without God. So what is the bad without God? Death and pain. If you don't have hope for an afterlife, what do you do? What do you talk about? Death. There is nothing after death. If you're a strict atheist, there is nothing. You have a corporeal existence. You're carbon uh, be, uh, material. And when your brain's gone, when your heart's gone, you're gone. And that is very comforting. It may seem morbid, 
but it's very comforting that you don't question things. Am I being punished? Am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? Nope. That's it. Death is a part of life. You accept that earlier on when you meet death. You can meet it with courage. Um, I was talking earlier about genes, ideas, and positive energy. You know, the, the girl in China or whatever, the genes, your, your relatives. Talk to them about ideas they put forth. Talk to them about what interests them. You put that in the world. You shared that with people. Your energy lives on. You will be in the hearts of every single person here. You'll be in my heart. Loss is necessary for life and for change. So um, if we don't lose something, we don't appreciate it when it's here. If the sun doesn't set, we don't appreciate it as much when it rises the next day. You know, I lived in Los Angeles, and it was 80 degrees and hot every day, and I got tired of the sun. But now that the sun comes and goes, where I live in Detroit, I really appreciate it more. The loss of that actually gave me an appreciation. Death is necessary to treasure what we have. We don't want to live forever. Who cares? We, we won't treasure what we have. Death is necessary to treasure what we have here. And um, death is motivating. If you are convinced that you, you will die at some point, it motivates you to be a better person. Some people say, you know, religious people are motivated by, by God or by hope in the afterlife, by hope or reward. We're motivated. We know we're not going to be here forever. So we're, we're only promised this moment. I'm making the best of this moment. Like I said, the bard said, pass this prologue. I'm not pa the, the patient could die in the next moment. The chaplain could die in the next moment. That's very morbid, but it's true. Death is necessary to... So um, death is motivating. Permanence does not equal value and meaning. You can talk about this. You don't want to live forever. Just because you don't live forever doesn't mean you haven't lived. Doesn't mean you ha that, that what you've lived isn't meaningful. It is. Permanence doesn't, doesn't guarantee meaning and value. We won. Why complain? We didn't win. Uh, we didn't win more. So... Um, <laughs> Hold on, I'm reading through my notes here. Um, so, um, you know, wanting to live forever, we, we, we won the lottery by being here. We are so lucky to be alive. It's like winning a million dollars and saying, oh, but I didn't win 10 million. Enjoy the million you have. And that's what that means. Um, after death is the same as before birth. We were not here for billions of years. Did anyone, was anyone in pain? Did anyone remember before we were here? No, it's the same thing after death, according to an atheist. So don't be afraid of it. Now, you may be afraid of dying and the pain of the process of dying, and that's another thing, and I'll talk about pain, but being dead is the same as not being born. There was no pain, there was no discomfort. You just weren't here. Um, Death is a part of life. Now, don't put someone in a position, and this is very important, of making a, this choice. So when you come into a room, be very careful about saying hope in the afterlife. Hope you'll be with your grandmother. You'll be with your mother. Because, and I say this with respect, religion can be a bully sometimes in that, like, you can't win office in this country if you don't say God bless America. You just can't. And that's bad for religion. That's one of the reasons of separation of church and state is because you want people to be sincere in their beliefs. You don't want them to say, God bless America, if they don't believe it just because they want to win office. So don't put someone in a position who's an atheist who's a little afraid because they're afraid if they say they're an atheist, they're going to be criticized. And you come in and say you'll be in, in heaven with your grandmother or believe in G all of these things. And then they have a choice. Either they agree with the chaplain about something they do not believe, or they're put in a position to defend their beliefs. It's a bad choice, especially when you're sick. You don't want the choice of, do I just say I believe it even though I don't, or do I defend my beliefs? Now I'm more irritated. So be careful about that. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't tell a Jew that their loved one is with Jesus. So why would you tell a non-believer that their loved one is in heaven? Um, the lie of atheists and foxholes, I want to talk about that. It's usually at the end of life, I, I talked about it, it was comforting. And once again, you wouldn't tell a Jew, you wouldn't tell a Muslim that when they die, you're going to reject your belief and you're going to go to Jesus when you die. Why would you tell an atheist that you're going to reject your convictions? You wouldn't. They're very convicted. They've convicted 
made the conviction, made the decision that there is no God. That's a tough decision. That's how they define themselves. So um, religion is actually more, more, more often questioned um, when, you, when you're dying. Um, am I going to go to heaven? Am I being punished? Do I really believe? You have this cognitive dissonance of, will I be with grandma? It doesn't seem likely. That's all a bunch of stress. Now, if it's making meaning for the patient, if it is meaningful, wonderful. I'm not saying disparage that, and m my language today is a little bit disparaging of that, I will admit, but I'm trying to give you the atheist's point of view. So I went on with that, but let me talk about pain. Suffering is unavoidable. It's a very Buddhist thing. Without pain, and if you went to the ACT presentation, I encourage you to look at it's a cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, acceptance, commitment therapy, mindfulness. All of these things um, talk about living in the moment with your suffering, not rejecting it, learning how to be strong, because you can't change that right now, but you can make the best of the moment. Without pain, there's no pleasure. That's similar to without death, you don't you know appreciate things. We're not being punished. These are things they th Learning and teaching opportunity. Hurt increases strength. You go through chemotherapy, I guarantee you on the other end, you are gonna be strong. That's not something I wanna go through. And you're gonna teach your family how strength, how a strong person lives. Deciding to end pain is an option. We have to be careful around that, but an atheist will consider that. Um, and so know that they're not going to, if they want to go home and be with their family, they're not going to sit there and be on life support systems that are, are keeping them immobile and, and they, they want to be with their loved ones. And it is an option. Um, clinical practice. So let's get, oh, I wanted to read to you, there's, there's a book uh, by Greta, Greta Christina, and I'll tell you that at the end, it's called um, Comforting Thoughts About Death That Have Nothing to Do With God. And I encourage you to read it. And she says, Atheism offers us the comfort of knowing that we can shape our own lives and don't have to rest our fate in the hands of a God whose ways can at best be described as mysterious. It offers the comfort of not having to wonder what we did wrong, why we're being punished or tested every time something bad happens. It offers the comfort of experiencing the world as shaped by a stable and potentially comprehensible set of physical laws, rather than by the capricious whim of a creator who is theoretically loving but in practice is moody, short-tempered, and wildly unpredictable. I didn't write this. It offers the comfort of being intimately connected to the rest of the universe rather than somehow set apart from it. It offers the comfort of being able to make our own moral judgments based on our own instincts and experiences rather than trying to reconcile the outdated and self-contradictory teaching of a centuries-old religious text or trying to second-guess the wishes of, of an invisible and imprecise deity. It offers the comfort of being able to see the world as it is to the best of our abilities without having to ignore the, or rationalize every experience that contradicts our faith. So um, I, I would suggest that book because it really outlines what a non-theist will believe, and, it, and if you're, especially if you're palliative care, hospice care, you're dealing with people dying, it's very important. Um, through the threshold, how do you get into the room before entering the room? Relationships within education, I was talking about this a lot with the IDT, you know what that is. Um, relationships with the other chaplains, um, be respectful if you, uh, you know, explore a patient's spiritual needs as the doctor would explore their medical needs. When you have a clearer picture, then proceed. Don't, and don't compromise your beliefs in doing that. Um, once again, um, be respectful with other chaplains as well. You can, you can talk to other chaplains about their belief, but, but not in a disparaging way. I, the, the, there was someone in a uh, Buddhist chaplain who I met who said they met another chaplain that told them point blank, you are going to hell. Um, this was another professional chaplain. Be respectful. You may not agree, um, but you, you're a team. You're working together. Um, check, explore your own biases. So, um, let me see here. Anyway, we, you, yeah, we would never, we, we would never and should never disparage religion 
And we should never disparage non-belief either. So just, just check your own biases. If you are of a spiritual practice, a religion that is charged with bringing God's truth to the world, that's your charge. What do you do when you face the question of how to deal with someone who completely refuses to accept that? In 15 minutes in a patient's room, that is your charge, and this person refuses to accept that, but you need to treat them spiritually. Is the value of your religious faith equal to the value of peace and of spiritual health of that person? Just think the questions over. Um, Plan possible responses, but go in without preconception. We're, we're the people without an agenda, but it doesn't mean you can't think about things before, before you go in um, and know what possible responses you can have. Um, use your resources. Many paths the truth. Their truth is their truth. You cannot tell them it's wrong. It is their truth. I don't agree with it, but it's not wrong because they believe it in their heart. Um, um, we, we had a talk about with the National Consensus Project here earlier, too, and the IDT members, uh, the clinical practice guidelines say IDT members respect patient and family beliefs and practices, never imposing their individual beliefs on others so, um, or people who don't believe anything. Let's see what else is there. Don't enter if you feel you can. If someone needs um, a Catholic chaplain, and I'm aware of that, um, I'm going to get one and bring them. Um, if someone is a humanist, if they respond and you feel you're making them more distressed or hurting them spiritually, know when it's time to leave. You may not have a humanist chaplain there, but you, you may have someone who is more in line with their beliefs. Or, or call someone. Have them get on the phone um, if you really need to, but, but don't cause more, or, or just don't do anything, but, but don't cause more harm. Um, What can I say? So statements that can be stressing, and you, and you probably know this. Can I pray for you? Praying for you. Many, many UUs, many theists, many Jews, they do pray. But prayer can, can be a tough word for many atheists because they think of it only as a petition to a higher power. I don't think of it that way, but I do think of it that way for some people, but it can be other things. So don't ask that right away. Have a blessed day. These are all things you know. They will be with God. They will be with their loved ones. These are great things to say if you are aware that that's what makes meaning for that person. But be careful. Know you're aware beforehand. God bless you. God loves you. Jesus would have. Um, the Bible says that. Only God knows. It's up to God. These are all things. So consider these things instead. Now, once again, these are neutral things. I'm not saying go in there and say there's no God you know, I'm not saying that uh, neutrality is, you know, the opposite of, of being religious is, 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 you know, disparaging it. Or neutrality is, is, is making it open to everybody. Can I offer some words of encouragement? Let us come together to honor the moment. I offer prayer in my tradition that I hope will be meaningful in yours. Uh, we were offered a very wonderful prayer at the beginning of this weekend, but it was in the reverence tradition. Uh, it didn't resonate with me. There was an attempt to be more inclusive, but it didn't resonate with me. And, and it would have been nice, and once again, with full respect, if you do that in, in, in a hospital for the staff or for the patients, if you're offering a prayer, just say, I'm offering this prayer in my tradition. I hope it will be meaningful in yours. Um, you can offer a neutral prayer, and I have some things. I often say, can I offer some words of encouragement in my tradition? I'm not familiar with your tradition. I would love it if you prayed in yours, and I will pray in mine. I don't have to do it out loud. Um, have a peaceful day instead of have a blessed day. You're not disparaging religion by saying that. You're not rejecting it. People who love God love peaceful days. Um, they will be with their love, and they will remain your heart in the hearts of those they touch. May you have a full recovery. I wish you peace and happiness an appropriate quote or joke. I often use humor. I, I was tasked with doing a, uh, a service because in CPE you have to do a service. Well, as a humanist, and I wasn't identifying as a you, you yet, now I could do a service. But, so I did a healing laughter service. And it was great. Um, laughter is amazing. You can't be laughing and be frowning at the same time. It's impossible. And your whole body knows that. Stay strong. That's something else you can say. Um, let me see, I'm running out of time here. Okay, 
Um, it's not about what we feel is right or wrong. We are... Um, okay. Oh, visualization. Sometimes, um, you know, I was called when I was in CPE, I, was, um, I had the pager overnight, and there was um, a person in the, in the giving birth, a woman giving birth, and the baby was going to die. Uh, and the chaplain was called. Um, and my chaplain uh, administrator, my boss, went instead of me. I was on call, but she said, I don't want you to go. And part of it, I think, also was because this, this patient identified as religious and I wasn't. But part of it is because I was new. I was very new, and that's a tough situation, so that's fine. Um, but there's a visualization. Uh, religious visualization might include something like, okay, the, Imagine this baby's energy as a light, their love, their warmth, their soul, their spirit. Picture this light warming your womb, moving out of your womb into heaven and being with God. It's beautiful. I wouldn't say that. But what I might say, as an atheist patient, imagine this baby's heart, warmth, strength, light. See this light. The light is glowing. The baby's body won't be here anymore but that light is moving into your heart. That light is spreading into the hearts of everyone in your family and everyone you love, and it will never leave those places. So instead of up, it's out. You can do alternative visualizations. And that's probably what I would have done, something like that, I don't know, um, if I was in the situation. The practical and the clinical, what can I do? Um, presence, companions, these are all things you know, professional chaplains, the same thing for anyone who's religious. Witness, respect, difference. Um, sincerity. Um, I've often been asked to pray the Lord's Prayer. If the person can't pray it themselves, I may do, but I wouldn't because it's uh, to someone who can pray it themselves, or I'm just saying the Lord's Prayer as an example because it's not sincere coming from me, but I would say I would love it if you prayed in your tradition and I prayed in mine at the same time and we connected in that way, it depends on the situation. I'm really treating that patient and if I do compromise my sincerity sometimes, it would only be for the benefit of the patient. But try not to, try to be honest, as honest as you can. Laughter, mindfulness, um, these are all practices you can use um, stretch and relaxation exercises. The person talked to me earlier talked about ritual. Write a poem together. Do a flower arrangement together. Do something, distract them. Um, there was a woman um, who, was, who was actively dying and she could not speak, but she could hear and she could see. So I investigated with her son. She was a gospel singer. So we created our little ritual and I would come in there and I asked the nurse if it was okay. And I, I would turn on my phone and play gospel music and just sit there with her. And you could tell in her physicality that she would immediately relax and immediately smile. You can find rituals that make meaning for non-theists as well. You can. Finding and helping others. Social service, talk about that too. If these people are very active, um, charity givers and activists talk about that. That is so meaningful. Or call a humanist. <laughs> call someone who can relate better. Um, so prayer. Um, I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, distraction, looking at my time, music, art, poetry, talked about that. Learn their language, listen and repeat, validate them. They will tell you what they're thinking and believing. Repeat it. You don't have to make anything up. Tell them back what they told to you. As, you know, give them that respect. Um, I, I write prayers, PRR, peaceful, rational, and real words, because that's my prayer, and per is an onomatopoeic sound that I feel when I'm praying. So that's why I write that. But you don't have to use a neutral prayer. I often do. Um, you can ask people to pray in their tradition, but there are many, if you want to look them up, that are, are not anti-religious, that you can use as a religious person. Um, Shine by Mary Edis. Like the cosmic dust following after a great Perseid meteor. We are the living remnants of time and all that has come to pass in its wake. Briefly shining lights on the way to eternity. We are only visible to the naked eye for an instant, so take this moment to shine 
like the stardust you are. May the light of our time on earth shine to bless the world and each other. Shine, shine, shine is a prayer. Ask the patient what they want to pray for and repeat those words in your prayer. Don't assume what they want to pray for. Ask them. Um, here's another one. Out of, out of our yearning. And this one uses the word God, but you can take it out if you want. Um, <clears throat> it's by uh, Susan Manker Seal. We speak to the God, the goddess, the spirit of life, the eternal. You could simply say we speak to the spirit of life. We speak to the mysterious thread that connects us one to the other and to the universe. We speak to the deep wisdom at the center of our beings. We embody the yearning of all people to touch each other more deeply, to hear each other more keenly, to see each other's joys and sorrows as our own and know that we are not alone unless we create solitude for ourselves. And even then, community awaits us. Out of our yearning, we have come to this community. You can say this religious community or this community. May we help each other to proclaim, proclaim the possibilities we see, to create the community we desire, to worship what is worthy in our lives, to teach the truth as we know it, to serve with justice in all the ways that we can, to, to the end that our yearning is assuaged and our lives fulfilled in one another. Let us go now into the silence of the faith that is unique to each of us and still the same. Let us be silent together for a moment. May peace be yours. It's an example. Um, milestones and celebrations. Bring the granddaughter in who's having a birthday. Celebrate something. Celebrate wise women in their lives. You know, whatever you want to celebrate. Education. Provide informational resources. Anderson oh. Cooper, this AC is a video. 60, CNN weeknights, I'll 10 watch it, then I'll talk about it. So you are hopeful? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not fatalistic. I'm not resigned. Um, but I'm realistic, too. The statistics in my case are very poor. Not many people come through esophageal cancer and, and... Actually, no, I am going to tell you a little about, about before, before... Oops. I press back. Okay. This is Christopher Hitchens. He is he's an avowed atheist. He was. He died in his 60s. Severe cancer. Um, as if any cancer isn't severe. He died of cancer. Um, and many atheists will not talk to you about what they're feeling or thinking because they're afraid and they don't want to be criticized. He doesn't mince words. So I want you to hear it because I want you to hear what an atheist might be thinking that they may not say. Anderson Cooper interviewed him and you'll hear he talks about people praying for him and about God and so let's, let's listen to it again, and hopefully I didn't mess this whole thing up. And maybe I did. Oh, wait, no. Press Anderson over. Cooper, AC 360, CNN weeknights, 10 Eastern. So you are hopeful? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not fatalistic, I'm not resigned. Um, but I'm realistic, too. The statistics in my case are very poor. Not many people come through esophageal cancer and, and live to talk about it. Well, not for long. And the other wager is, well, the part of the wager, is it's a certainty you'll have a terrible time and you may wish you were dying because it, it's, a, it's an awful process. That you can't escape. You're going to get that no matter what. And then the, the torture period may or may not be worth it or it may be torture followed by an execution. The, I know you know that there are people praying for you. There are prayer groups, actually. And, and you talked about that a little bit. Um, what do you think about that, the fact that people are praying for you? There are people who are praying for me to suffer and die. They have lavish websites, relish in mind. Really? Oh, yeah. And then there are people, much more numerous, I must say, um, and nicer, <laughs> who are praying either that I get better or that, that I um, redeem myself that I make peace with the Almighty. That, that, and that my soul gets saved even if my wretched carcass does not. Um, and some pray for, pray for both. And in fact, the 20th of September has been designated um, Everyone Pray for Hitchens Day on my website, in case you want to mark your mark the calendar for that. I shall not be taking part in that. Um, so you don't pray at all? No. No, that's all that's meaningless to me. I don't think that souls or bodies can be changed by incantation. I don't think souls or bodies can be changed by incantation. He doesn't pray, but he's fine with people praying for him. 
as long as they're not praying for him to die. <laughs> He's fine with that as well. And at the end of that, you should watch it. It's about 15 minutes. He talks about many, many things and family. And it, and it really gets into the mind of an atheist as they're dying. Um, we did a, we did a, in CPE, we did a practice, uh, uh, an exercise where we read something by C.S. Lewis and then we were tasked with writing a verbatim as if we were treating C.S. Lewis. I would say, <laughs> write a verbatim as if you're treating Christopher Hitchens. See what you come up with. Um, and watch the whole thing first. At the end, Anderson Cooper actually asks him, um, would you ever hedge your bets at the end? You know, the no atheists in foxholes, would you, would you turn to God? And he says, absolutely not. He said, if you ever hear in the news that Christopher Hitchens turned to God, it wasn't me. I was delusional. I was out of my mind. And he says this outright. He said, it won't be true. There's conviction there. Don't doubt that conviction if you're treating someone who's dying who's an atheist. Um, let me see here. Materials we provide. Um, uh, this is just an example of the military, because um, I talked earlier about providing materials. They, they made an attempt, when you provide materials, really know what you're providing. They made an attempt at a connection to an authentic non-theistic perspective. Um, if you do it and you don't, you're not honest about it and you not do your research, you're, you're very likely to make mistakes. An example here is the Army got entirely wrong when they attempted to do so. It was an attempt to outreach toward humanists, which the Army has never really done, but they were tempting diversity, or at least that's what the claim was, but they posted what they called a virtual spiritual fitness center with the stated attempt to reach everybody, but what they got was this extreme conservative Christian evangelism thinly veiled with some random links to pagan uh, ideologies. Uh, they got the, the perspective that is best represented by their chaplaincy, it's true, which was around 98% Christian, two-thirds of which are endorsed by political evangelists, evangelicals, not the least open to diverse chaplain expressions. Um, on the right, you will see the Military Atheists, Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers post another page um, where they explain things a little bit better. So there are ways to do it. Um, conf consult people. Don't make an attempt if you're not informed, but we really, really, really should change the literature and make sure people understand um, the, the different sets of beliefs. And this is, this is um, an image of, of a guard. Chaplain visited. We are sorry we missed you. If you need the service, well wishes. God bless you. Whoops. I meant to cross out. How did that happen? <laughs> God bless you is crossed out on my screen. I'm not going to say that's a sign of anything. <laughs> um, humor, see? There's a bunch of resources which you can't read, but if you download the, 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 the PDF, you can access all these resources. Take a picture if you want. Um, yeah, these are some great, great resources. Um, and there's tons of them. These are some books. I talked earlier about Greta Christina, and, and her book is listed here. Um, conf um, comforting Thoughts About Death That Have Nothing to Do With God. Um, Christopher Hitchens' book is in here. Judaism in a Secular Age is a humanistic Jewish book. Good Without God. If you're at the APC, you'll hear Greg Epstein speak with Jason Callahan. They're two wonderful humanist chaplains at universities and hospitals, and Greg Epstein wrote this book, Good Without God. Um, creating Change Through Humanism. If you want to know about positive um, non-theistic beliefs and what you can do to create change, that's a great book. Um, there, there are a bunch of happiness I put on there. Matthew Ricard, that, that was really the book that started my spiritual journey. Humanist Ceremonies Handbook, um, that's a new one, and you will actually see my picture in there and my contributions. Uh, writing and performing humanist weddings, memorials, and other life cycle ceremonies, that is what I do as well. I am a certified humanist celebrant and certified humanist chaplain. I'm not a board certified chaplain, but that's why I'm getting my Master of Divinity, to work toward that. Um, but. Oftentimes, you will be asked to perform a ceremony. I don't know if you'll ever be asked to perform a secular ceremony, but I went into a room, and the patient, once again, identified as Catholic, and the sons were there. This was a different room from the one I was talking about before, and she was dying. She was at the end, and I spent a lot of time with the two boys who were religious. I'm not, 
and the first time I ever met them, and they asked me to do their mother's funeral. So I needed to be prepared, and I suggest reading the ceremonies handbook, but you get some really good ideas about how to be prepared if you were to do a service for someone who is not religious. And um, as the gentleman talked to me before, if you want to create a ritual in the room with somebody, um, you might get some good ideas too. So um, it is 1.20, we have about 10 minutes. I don't know, I'm sorry, that doesn't leave much time for questions um, or statements. Um, I'm happy to respond to anything if, if anyone would like to ask anything. And, and I can give a response. If not, I'll do my research and find an answer. They are. Unitarian Universalist has what's called the Worship Web, and you can find all manner of poems there. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that's where I got them, but they are in my, in my resource, yeah. They were asked, someone was asking if the poems were listed in the resources. Oh, go ahead. I don't know if the mic is on. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, what do you do when you walk into a room and uh, you introduce yourself as the chaplain mm -hmm. and they just want to politely send you out the door? So, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean, I've ran into that and I have my own uh, ways of dealing with it, but I wanted to ask how you do with it. Um, well, it depends on the person and the situation. Most often, I, I would do what they ask me to do. Um, but that's, that speaks to educating the patient and the hospital. That speaks to changing uh, the culture so that the patient is aware what spiritual care does. If they're aware that they could use a chaplain, they may not do that. If they're unaware and they're in spiritual distress, then I do what they ask me to do. Um, I may inquire, um, I, I'm here. If you want to talk about anything at a later point, you know, I'm, I'm happy to leave now. If you feel like just sitting and talking, um, you know, I just try to explain, I'm just here to, t to, to see how you're feeling emotionally, that's it. And I'm, I'm always here in the hospital, call me if you need me. Make sure that they know my presence is, is available to them. Actually, my statement was going to address just that. Oh, good, please, yeah. When I was in CPE, I went into, well, I stood at the doorway of a room, and, and the wife and the patient were sitting there, and the wife motions me like this, <laughs> uh, like warning me. Yeah. And she points to her husband, and she mouths, she goes, he's agnostic. And I didn't cross that doorway, but we made eye contact, and I said, um, is that true, sir? Mm -hmm. And he said, what? And I said, that you're a man of questions. I said, I can appreciate a critical thinker. There you go. And that caught him off guard, and he responded uh, with, with some hostility, and he goes in, into, um, he says, if uh, you, you church people read one darn book and you think you know everything about life and you don't and uh, life is a philosophy he tells me but what would you know about philosophy well he didn't know I, my undergrad degree is in <laughs> philosophy and I didn't even bring that up and I said okay what about this I said what if I leave my God outside the door, and this is just between me and you. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, what if I just care enough to show up, to listen, and to wish you well? What did he say? It just, it just changed yeah. the demeanor. Mm -hmm. We established a relationship. He ended up to be a very wealthy man who had never been sick. He, he was uh, repeatedly admitted. Uh, I became his chaplain, and I walked with him to his death, actually. And I, I thank you for that. You deferred to him. You validated him. You listened to him. You uh, appreciated, you know, you, you, you did so many things right, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, and I, and I appreciate that's what we need to do. We need to listen, validate, hear, um, be present, let the people know that we respect them, 
and, and I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a perfect example. Hi, um, that was excellent. Thank you for that example of certain verbiage um, yeah. that we can use with folks. Um, where I work is, um, I guess what you would, some people would stereotypically say a lot of mountain folk. Mm -hmm. um, just good old country or, I mean, just very, I don't know, most of them have not graduated high school. And so some of these words, spiritual, stuff like that, and I see a lot of them really grasp, gra uh, really wrestling with the religion of their ancestors, if you will, their mom, their dad, but also trying to make meaning. So is trying to make without meaning. God. Right. And so seeing those two worlds collide, I was wondering if you had any, any other verbiage that, that would resonate more um, I, with folks that was outside spiritual or even meaning making. I mean, that, that whole concept is just, I can just <laughs> see their face. Like, I don't even, and I keep kind of backtracking trying to explain you know, and I, I have used, um, you know, talking about, how about I just be with you? Can I just be with you through this process? Oftentimes it is very scary for folks. I, I recognize that you might not be scared, but how about, I, how about I stay with you throughout this journey? Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any other examples. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's case by case. It, it, it's truly difficult when you're, when you're questioning religion, when you're questioning your belief system, it's very difficult. You're in the patient's room for a short time. You know, it, it, I, I could think of some verbiage maybe, and maybe I should write that down, um, but I would be present and like the other person said, really listen, ask some open-ended questions to, that, to them just get them talking about what they do understand, what they do know. They may have more questions and you can talk through that with them from their perspective, but even say something like, you know, I know this is totally nothing to do with anything, but I always ask each patient what their favorite color is. So just, it's a survey I'm taking, what's your favorite color? Red, oh really, why? Why, why is it red? And you know, that's simple, but you get them talking about something, something that they know. They where, where do you live? Oh, there's a lot of, X, Y, Z in that area. I know I've been to that area. Can you, you know, tell me a little bit more about it? It doesn't have to be a, a spiritual exploration, but oftentimes when you explore what makes meaning for them, even if it's not spiritual, you as the chaplain can sort of discern some theology from that. But it, it's, it's tough, and I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> so... Just, just one thing, um, I, I thought, I, as many of you know, I'm from Vermont, the least religious state in the country, and so um, I was asked, um, even by the staff in the emergency department a couple of years ago, could I do a s service in the um, emergency department? There had been a lot of death, but also a lot of staff that had had um, traumatic family members' deaths, and my... Um, instruction was I could not go close to God, I could not mention God, I could not say a prayer, I could not do any of that. And the majority of the patients are listed as none. And so who is the chaplain? So um, one thing I do, because we have Vermonters, <laughs> I grew up in North Carolina in the mountains, um, there was not a lot of difference. So what I um, do, <laughs> so really chaplain is a very scary, Words. So the biggest thing is just to get in the door. Um, and so one thing that I do with people who have absolutely no religious beliefs and no interest in the chaplain is I will say, tell me, are you a Vermonter? And they go, yes, yes. And I'll say, okay, I am not, and I have great respect. And so I'm going to, and I am the chaplain, so may I ask you a question? Are you stubborn? <laughs> Are you independent? Is being in the hospital a real challenge for you? Yes, yes. Do you have a can-do attitude? Yes. Do you never complain? Never complains, which is a challenge for family members. And I say, all right. I call that the religion of the Vermonter. And as soon as I say that, I'm golden, and they will have a seat. So 
Try the religion of the mountain man. Well, let, <laughs> thank you so much for that. See, I knew I would be learning more from you, from you folks. Um, and thank you for that. And also thank you for your question as well. This conversation has taken me back 20 years to my residency oh, okay. um, at UVA in Virginia, um, where I had a colleague who was a Unitarian without a theistic concept. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the issues that we struggled with back then was we had a neonatal ICU, mm -hmm. and we had an infant that was on ECMO that was dying. Um, and one of the struggles in CPE group was to understand, and for this chaplain resident to understand what they could offer that family. Um, because there's not a life to reflect on. There's not a lot of what we can connect with, with people um, that have lived a life. Uh, and I went into a hospital that doesn't have a neonatal ICU, so I've not had to be challenged by that um, over the years. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little about what um, a humanist or an, or an atheist chaplain might do with a family dealing with the death of an, of an infant. That's a good question, and, and I think I mentioned the visualization before, but it, it's mm -hmm. much more complex than that. Okay. Um, this presentation really is about the non-believer as the patient, not the chaplain. I am in formation as a chaplain, so without thinking it through, I'm not going to speak to that right now. It's an excellent question, and you're free to contact me, and I will think through it, and I will get back to you. But that is for another presentation how do I deal as, as a humanist with coming into a room where someone has a, a very, very profound belief in, in God? It's, it's a challenge, um, but, but thank, thank you. you for the question. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation, no. and I <clears throat> appreciate that in a culture that is so dominated by a theistic orientation, it takes courage. So thank, thank you. you. Um, my question is, you made reference to having a humor or laughter therapy group or celebration Healing or something laughter. like that. Healing laughter group. Can you tell us how you do that or what, what oh, you yeah. do Oh yeah, you that? can get trained. You can get a certificate in healing laughter. Now you have to be careful because it's very physical and some patients you have to do at different levels. But literally, if you smile, if you go, ha, 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 your brain says, I'm laughing now and automatically you get happier, even if you're sad, just the physicality of it. So you sit in a room and you have people, you know, uh, ex do exercises that, um, that tell your body physically that you're happier. So it's not, I'm a stand-up comedian and I'm telling jokes. Now I do that too, but no. Uh, <laughs> it's not that, it's a physicality. You know, Buddhists often say, I think that you, you, you can't have two competing emotions and states at the same time. Um, hatred and love don't exist at the same time. And the same thing with happiness and sadness and laughter. You, you're not gonna completely change the person, but if you physically tell them, put a smile on, laugh, I know you feel depressed right now, I know you feel bad, I know this is silly, just try it. It really, really changes the physiology and the physiognomy, and in, in a way, in, in your brain, your brain processes that and thinks you're happy, even if you're not. Now, it, it, it's not a, 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 a cure-all, but but read more about it. I'm not an expert in it. It's called Healing Laughter, and you can get a certificate. And I I looked into it because I didn't know what other service to do, honestly, <laughs> and and it went over very well. <laughs> Hey, uh, Joshua, thank you. Um, I want to go back to that family you described, uh, a, a mother who was dying and no longer conscious, who mm -hmm. was Catholic, I think you said, mm -hmm. and then two sons who were atheists and a daughter who was Wiccan. Mm -hmm. And you said that children were my patient. And, and I think you're right to have extended your chaplain role to the children but not to forget the mother. So I, I have a, I spent years as a hospice chaplain, worked a lot with people with Alzheimer's who were at the very end of their life and were no longer conscious. Mm -hmm. So I would often ask myself, what am I doing if I'm in the room of a person who can no longer communicate, who can't hear me? Who can, um, I think I ended up in the position that it, as long as that person is alive, then I need to be there to witness to their life, mm -hmm. the ending of their life, um, and to, uh, to care for them 
even if, the, even if I'm not actively doing things with that person. And so I just wondered uh, whether, in addition to caring for the children, um, you, you might have had a discussion with them about what, what their mother might want. Absolutely. And so, and so um, helping them see that honoring their, their mother's um, religious beliefs and practices might be important to her even at this last stage of her life while she's still living. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Absolutely, and I appreciate you bringing that up because it's not only important to her to honor her religious tradition. Even though they're non-theistic, yeah. it's important for, to them mm -hmm. to honor her tradition. I think it might be, it might well be. Yeah, uh -huh. so I did do that. I explored what, you know, what would your mother have wanted mm. as well. I, I found what their values and their goals were um, and what made meaning for them, ultimate meaning. But I, part of that was, was appreciating what their mother believed as well. So I really do appreciate you yeah. bringing that up. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on what David is saying, um, in those sorts of situations, one of the questions I ask the family is, would prayer be meaningful now to your mother? Yeah. Um, and usually they, yeah, it would be very meaningful. Um, but I, I am of the bent that I never walk in and say, would you like me to pray with you, to pray for you? Um, I correct nurses when they say the chaplain has come to pray. I yeah. say, no, I've come to have a conversation with you. And I always ask people, even if they are blatantly religious, would prayer be meaningful to you right now? Right. I never assume. And I oftentimes don't pray with people because the conversation has gone a different direction. So I think we as chaplains need to uh, be very careful about uh, use of prayer, assuming prayer, and those sorts of uh, things. But thank you, David. Absolutely, thank you both. I I'm encouraged by this because I didn't know as a new chaplain what to expect coming here, and, and people have been so enlightened and open-minded, the chaplains here, and I'm learning so much, and I and appreciate the perspectives. Yeah, I'm, my name is Corp Buchanan from Montgomery Hospice in uh, Maryland. And first of all, I just as a Christian, I want to say thank you for your perspective. I, I really you. do. Um, if I, as I'm reflecting on what I've heard you say, it's this is really a conversation about how do we best meet people where they are. Yes. Um, and I hear that so significantly. Um, as I am reflecting also on the culture and context of our country um, and realizing that religiosity is in a serious decline yes. um, I, and that so much of this conversation I think wraps around, um, I, would, I would describe it as exclusivity, religions, uh, the historic, uh, the history of religion and the issue of exclusivism. Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, I know what's right and, you know, and you can find out what's right as well if you believe what I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyway, my question is, and, and I guess my thought is, we're going to be as chaplains encountering, in fact, this last month I encountered just this, uh, people who have this exclusive kind of religious perspective and in the case that I just dealt with, how do I deal with dad that is atheist? And he's been a devout atheist. And we're, you know, sitting here as these devout Catholics. And how do we, you know, wrap our head around this? So my question is, are there resources that you think of or that might be helpful in that conversation? Almost on the flip side, how do we help these people that are really struggling with having a very exclusive um, perspective of their own religion while essentially everybody around them starts becoming atheist or something, you know, not, does not have that kind of, of strong uh, faith tradition. It's true. You feel, you feel you're under attack and that's, yeah. you know, that's people, Christmas is under attack, that's the, the theme or whatever. It really isn't, but it's scary when you've committed your life, when you've identified as yourself in a certain way and everyone else is saying, no, that's wrong. Um, you feel under attack, and you have to be you have to be compassionate and empathetic about that. This is a larger issue. This is a larger struggle in this country um, to have compassion and empathy, to use forgiveness when your neighbor has hurt you, 
we don't want to do that. We want revenge. We want vengeance. We need to change that. And that's a bigger, a, a larger issue. And we can use, uh, and we can set the example for that, but it's going to take time to change. In the meantime, you know, we, if we want someone to hear us, we need to listen and validate them first mm -hmm. and set the example of doing that. But when you're in a, in a room for 10 minutes and someone is scared because they feel their, their faith is under attack, um, you've diagnosed their spiritual issue. Yeah. And, and so really be understanding of that um, and, and really put, try and put yourself in their shoes. And whether even if you think they're right or wrong, feel that fear. Um, you know, again, there's no easy answers and certainly not coming from me, but I appreciate the thought because these things are making us all think whether I have an answer or not. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think this transition that you're talking about is going to be critical for us to remain relevant as chaplains. Absolutely. If, if we're going to remain you know, Absolutely. professionals. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I don't, it's 10th or now. I don't want you to miss, because I talked about impermanence, the mandala blowing because that's going to be very awesome. <laughs> so thank you very much.